Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's for
just want to thank all these gentlemen for being here tonight and for your service to our country and to the community. And just outside the theater door, just to your left as you're leaving our, our theater, you're going to see there's a display for our local American Legion and the VFW, two organizations that bring together American soldiers, provide support to soldiers and their families in need, and promote security, freedom, and peace. There's a jar there. As you're able, and we'd love if you could just make a donation to, to the American Legion and the VFW. And finally, while weapons and the art of warfare have changed a great deal in the last hundred years, the burden of war weighs heavy on the soldiers. Today, one in three servicemen and women live with post-traumatic stress disorder. A portion of tonight's proceeds will be donated to the Wounded Warrior Project a veterans organization that has committed millions of dollars to providing treatment for PTSD at several top-notch hospitals across the country at no cost to the veteran or to their family. And we thank them very much for that. And with that, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Laura Malinchuk, who's going to introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, this evening kicks off the seventh season of PTSA-supported lectures by Bill Malega. Be sure, to grab, be sure to grab a Save the Date flyer up in the front with the topics about the winter series that he's going to be starting uh, in January. Mr. Malega has taught at Chapel Hill High School for 21 years. In 2010, he was named the Veterans of Foreign War National Educator of the Year for his dedication to, bring, to bringing history to life in the classroom, which he really does. If you've ever had a student in this classroom, the stories that they can tell at the dinner table are amazing. <laughs> Bill developed a writing program to show how, how to effectively use the resources and to increase critical thinking, um, the thinking of skills of the students. And he's presented a program at the National Advancement Placement College Board Conference in San Francisco in 2011. This led to his selection as the sole author for the 2015 SAT World History Subject Test Review from Barron Educational Books. The second ed edition of this book will be released this week. Bill has worked with the Transatlantic Teaching Scholars Program in France, with the Churchill Foundation Archives in London, and on the AP US History ChronoZoom Timebook for the Library of Congress. All through the years, Bill Malika has led his high school students on numerous learning adventures in Europe and the United States. We're fortunate to have him here tonight um, to take us on a journey back to the days of World War I. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bill Malika. actually has uh, some credentials. So question, um, it's hard to constrain me to a microphone. Can everybody hear me or should I use the microphone? We're all good? Thank God. All right. So anyway, um, for the fifth time, thank you guys for coming out tonight. We've never done anything this big with the lecture series before. So we were all sweating. Is anybody going to show up or, or not? So uh, at least we have um, a, a good packed house. So tonight, we're going to walk you through uh, 90 minutes. You guys aren't going to have to stay awake. We're going to compress a five-hour lecture into 90 minutes. We're going to walk you through how the war got started and ending with um, how America got involved and um, how they helped change the average regular Joe helped change the world um, power structure. So you're going to learn stuff that uh, you didn't even know you didn't know. <laughs> like many of you, when you think about World War I, it's uh, the trenches and it's the all quiet on the western front over the top 50, 60 yards uh, of no man's land. And a couple years ago, I uh, was with a group that we traveled over to France and Belgium to really look at um, what happened in World War I. What was America's role? And my job was, I, th I think I had the best job there, where I got to walk pretty much all 27 miles, or most of the 27 miles of the Meuse-Argonne battlefield, um, talking to farmers and people and tourists from, from other countries. And what I learned 
um, pretty much changed my whole perception of not only World War I itself, but our role within it. Um, like everyone else, I thought we were a Johnny come late when we showed up at the end and kind of nudged the Allies over the finish line. And what I found out was that the Europeans give us, um, you know, Belgians, French, British, even Germans give us a lot more credit than um, we, we give ourselves. So uh, without further ado, let's get this thing started. Um, going up to the war, um, Europe was a family affair. Most of the people um, on this, uh, you know, pictures behind me knew each other. Queen Victoria here of England gave birth to, um, or not gave birth, but she did, um, to many of the royals. And three of the big um, combatants, um, King George, Kaiser Wilhelm, and Tsar Nicholas, were cousins. Uh, as a matter of fact, as young boys, they used to play together on, on holiday, and Nicholas and George used to beat up on poor um, Wilhelm, the guy with the nice mustache there. He had kind of a gimpy arm, his dad was mean to him, Queen Victoria called him the most melancholy, um, you know, angry child she had, had ever met. So they would play hide and go seek, they would say, hey William, go hide, we'll come find you, and then they would leave him there for four hours. <laughs> anyway, um, down here we have the guys who are going to get it all started. Uh, these are the rulers, um, the ruler Franz Joseph of Austria-Hungary and his heir to the throne, um, Franz Ferdinand. Franz Joseph's only son had committed suicide, his wife had died, so he was kind of a bitter, angry guy at this really interesting moment um, in world history. There are things that I like to call door hinges of world history where you close the door to the past behind you and you step into this new, never before seen future. And that's what all these guys um, represent, the old monarchical past, the way Europe had been run since you know, um, you know, Prince Henry the Navigator started sailing down in Portugal. And this guy here is an interesting guy. His name is Aravon Bismarck. I don't know if he's a Jedi or a <laughs> Sith Lord. Um, he's a real, real, real interesting character that will change the landscape of Europe and help bring about not one, but two um, world wars. So we got to go back in, in history a little bit. And uh, 100 years before World War I starts, the Emperor Napoleon was just defeated. He had just been beaten at the Battle of, of Waterloo by the Duke of, of Wellington. And that was a very vicious, nasty battle where over 20,000 people were killed just outside Brussels. And after that happened, the royals of Europe were, were terrified. King Louis XVI had just had his head cut off in the French Revolution. We get this tiny little um, Corsican emperor, and the royals were afraid. So in Austria, the emperor Francis I and his prime minister Clemens von Metternich have this thing called the Congress of Vienna. It's 10 months of hunting and drinking and dancing, and in the middle of that, they did a little bit of work. And they decided that they were going to do two things besides have fun. Number one was they were going to find a way to preserve the monarchies. An attack on one royal is an attack on all of us. So we've got to make sure our way of life stays true. The second thing they wanted to do, because Napoleon you know, you know, was the first guy to bring an entire country to industrialized warfare, so to speak, we don't want any one country to get bigger or more powerful than any one of us. We're going to contain, maintain a balance of power. And this is a really difficult thing to do, specifically for Austria-Hungary, Europe's oldest monarchy, going back to the 1300s. 25% of the Austria-Hungarian Empire was made up of German-speaking Austrians. They were a cosmopolitan collection of different ethnicities. You know, Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, you name it, Hungarians, who didn't really like to be under this, you know, veal of this monarchy. To their south is the Ottoman Empire, which was also a cosmopolitan, multicultural, multi-religious, multi-ethnic empire. And everybody in those two empires really wanted to be independent. So as we go through the 1800s, a couple factors are going to lead quickly to war. Here is um, Clemens von Metternich, handsome gentleman, and there is his boss, 
Emperor Francis I. And this was like 17, you know, hundreds, you know, royals being royal, like fairy tale type setting. And here's the Austria-Hungarian Empire. You can see how big it is, going deep in, into Russia, down into the Balkan states, over into Italy and Germany. It was a big, massive, prestigious empire. And in the middle of the um, uh, century, an interesting thing is going to happen. Um, number one, it was the age of imperialism where the European countries decided to go a conquering and take over smaller, tiny little countries to gain resources. The idea is to gain wealth for the mother country. So if England gets one, France has got to get two. So England's got to get three, and on and on and on. And they carved up the entire world. This is the time where England had the empire on which the sun never sat. And so they're trying to keep this balance of power, but yet they're at each other's throats. And then in mid-century, the era of nationalism hits. My country is simply better than your country. And here's where Otto von Bismarck will turn the 360 German kingdoms, the saying was there was a prince in Germany for every single day of, of the year, into a brand spanking new nation. That's the game changer in Europe. Germany went from a loose collection of states to the number two most powerful country in Europe by defeating Austria and France within six years. It dealt two old world empires mighty death blows, scaring everybody to death. Who are these new German guys? And Bismarck will spend the next several years building this elaborate tangle of alliances. He was a very smart guy who knew that Germany could handle any one opponent in one direction, but not two. And so his objective was to alienate France, whom he couldn't stand, and Mother Russia, keep them separated from each other by this intricate web of alliances. In 1888, his boss dies. And when King Wilhelm I dies, his son, who used to be picked on by George and Nicholas over here, and George and Nicholas looked so much alike, most people thought that they were both twins. Well, Wilhelm's first move is to fire Otto von Bismarck. He did not want to be told what to do by this old man. He was going to be his own man. He was going to prove himself. And he makes several mistakes that are going to lead us towards war. We all know the story of um, Franz Ferdinand getting shot in Sarajevo. If not, we'll do that one real fast. June 28th is a, is a nasty date in um, you know, Bosnia and Serbia. It's the date that they were conquered by the Ottoman Empire in 1389. And they stayed that way for a little over 600 years. Then on June 28th, um, they're liberated in 1911. They're like, woo, we're independent, awesome, it's going to be great. And they have a good time for about four hours. <laughs> <laughs> and then they find out that they've been assimilated into the Austria-Hungarian Empire. And they're like, what? We just became independent. This is garbage. Well, too bad. No soup for you. You're going to have to. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's some sign help. People. So, by this time, the emperor, Franz Joseph, is like six days older than dirt. And he is not going to go on his annual tour of all the you know, parts of his empire. He wants his heir to the throne, his nephew, to do it. And he has recently gotten married to a woman who was a noble by birth. But her family had come on hard times, and she was kind of poor and broke. And she makes the mistake of telling the newspapers, hey, I, I've never been out of Austria before. I can't wait to go see all of my subjects. And we're going to start in Sarajevo, and we're going to arrive on June 28th. And they're like, first of all, lady, what do you mean, your subjects? You're like a goat herder or something. I know what your job is, and you're calling us your subjects, and you're coming on the exact date that you know really sticks in our craw. You're doing it on purpose, so the only thing we can do is, well, we got to kill them. I mean, that's really, <laughs> really the only option we have here. So on June the 28th, young 19-year-old Gabriel Princep, um, after the, the four other assassins failed, um, it was the, like, the most you know, comical assassination attempt of all time. 
Gabriel, after eating his sandwich and praying, is standing on the street corner, and literally, the Archduke pulls up and stops right in front of him. He shoots the Archduke and um, his wife, point blank range, and that's going to start World War I. It was the, the spark that lit um, the fuse. Austria-Hungary says, that's it. We're going to come down there, Serbia, and we are going to hammer you. And they gave them five harsh ultimatums. You're going to do this, 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 and this. And Serbia agreed up to four of the five. But for some reason, Franz Joseph just didn't go and do it. He waited, and he waited, and he kept posturing. And at this time, the secret web of alliances that Bismarck had built had disintegrated, and new secret alliances had been created that no one knows about. Well, all the royals are like, go down there and get them. An attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. Go, 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 go. Except the country of Russia. Russia badly needed a friend. They really wanted somebody to, to like them. And they make the mistake of saying that we are the protector of all Slavic people. Right? If anybody harms a Slav, we're going to step in and we are going to help defend them, causing a bunch of unrest in the Austria-Hungarian and Ottoman Empire. And so Germany tells Austria, Kaiser Wilhelm tells Austria, look, don't worry about Russia. We're going to give you a blank check of support. Anything you need, you let us know. We're brand new, industrialized. we got all kinds of guns and, and, and machines. You just go and, and do what you want. And Serbia's like, dear God, oh, we probably can't take Austria-Hungary, let alone Germany. Can somebody please help us? And Russia says, yeah, blah, blah, slew. I will be right there. <laughs> <laughs> she will help you. It's going to be much good. Yeah, so um, when that happens, Russia steps in and says, hey, Austria, back off. Leave Serbia alone. They're going to handle this. And Russia begins to mobilize their forces. Now, mobilization is technically an act of war. You get all of your men and your equipment ready. That's probably true for everybody except Russia, except Russia is so big, it's so vast, their railroads are terrible, their roads are muddy, it's going to take them months to get ready. And when they mobilize, Kaiser Wilhelm, because he's impulsive and angry, declares war on Russia. This whole thing should be a localized war with Austria going down and handling Serbia, and now Russia and Germany are involved. Well, Russia's saying, what we do now, we're going to be a tip. It's not good. <laughs> so my Russian accent's not real good tonight. And they call on their buddy France. Oh, yes, Germany, we do not like them very much at all. <laughs> and the Germans had just hammered France in the Franco-Prussian War, took back Alsace and, and, and Lorraine, and made Napoleon III sign the surrender of his country in the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. They really want a chance to get back at Germany, but they're kind of afraid of them. So they tell Russia, hey, we'll give you the blank check of support, the one that Germany's given um, Austria. And the Germans say, you know, is it not good to front war? You French stay out of it, or we're going to come over there and beat you. We're going to knock the crepes out of you with your hard baseball bat like, like bread. <laughs> and they declare war. And so now we've got Germany, Russia, France in the war. Austria still hasn't gone down and attacked Serbia. And the French turn to their once and, um, old enemy England and says, hey guys, you've got to help us. And England says, I don't know, man. I don't know, you know, bully old sport. You know, what the fish and chips have you gotten yourself into? We've got the empire in which the sun never sat. We're good. And the Germans are going to come up to uh, the old fortress towns, Verdun, the Metz, these ancient towns who've been around since the time of Charlemagne. And they're heavily fortified. Now we know it as the Maginot Line. They're like, heck with this. We'll just go around and we'll go through Belgium. It's easy. It's flat. We'll get some waffles. We'll get some freaks. We'll see the mannequin teams. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> The problem is, um, Bismarck had all this drawn up. He said, if by chance we're dumb enough to get into a two-front war, 
All right, we've got to take one enemy out in France right away, give them a knockout blow, and then we can turn and deal with the Russians. So as conflict is about to start in the late summer of 1914, we've got Germany, Austria, and Italy, and the Ottoman Empire is going to take on the United Kingdom, France, and Mother Russia. And so the Schlieffen plan takes off, and it works like a charm. And when the Germans go through Belgium, England had guaranteed Belgian neutrality. They're forced to jump in. On August 3rd, 1914, the war officially starts. And as the German soldiers march through Belgium, they're described as Visigoths, or Huns sacking Rome. They literally destroy everything in their path. And what is terrible, they destroy the old library in the beautiful old city of, of Leuven where there were manuscripts going back to the Middle Ages, and they just burned. And as the Germans are marching into France, their plan is working better than their wildest dreams. They're about 30 miles from Paris, and all of a sudden they stop. It was a very stifling, hot summer. It was the hottest summer recorded um, in Europe up to that point in the, in the century, over 100 degrees. It was just absolutely brutal. So here are the Germans coming into the fortified French towns, and this is going to be the American sector down in here where all these um, uh, towns are. Um, George Patton's Third Army would fight in the same area in, in World War II. And here is the big hook just short of the Marne River, just outside um, Paris. And here's where the war is going to take a nasty turn. Uh, we have five new weapons that people talk about, but there's actually a, a sixth one. And we have the brand new machine gun. The Maxim machine gun will turn two machine gunners, give them the same power as 50 to 100 machine gunners with a smoothbore musket. The French had a machine gun called the Show Show. Um, the Americans called it the Should Have Shot because it jammed up all the time and it didn't really work um, very well. The tank is going to come into play. The airplane, this is just 11 years after Wilbur and Orville flew down um, in duck. Uh, poison gas, which we'll talk about here in a few seconds, and the submarine. But what is often underrated is the new rifles. The, the French um, Lavelle, the British Enfield, and the German Mauser are accurate now up to 400 yards. And the problem with this, the, the military doctrine of the day was still written by Napoleon. And Napoleon came within a whisker of conquering Europe two times by massing his, his soldiers up in these two giant columns, and they slammed through um, defenses, ran over them, and then encircled them. Except when he fought the British. The Duke of Wellington would string his guys out in a long horizontal line, and he made his guys practice with live ammunition and a British musketeer could fire his weapon five times inside a minute. And the problem with the column is only the guys on the edges could return fire. When they were shot, they caused everybody else to, to stumble. This stuff didn't work. We tried it in the Civil War, and it didn't work. 625,000 Americans. They tried it in the Crimean War, and it didn't work. And we're still using 100-year-old tactics. And everyone forgets, yeah, it was close, but Napoleon lost. So why we're still using his stuff, I don't know. And we've got weapons that can now fire faster, up to 400 yards. So it's almost criminal, the leadership, as we get into the war here, that will just send their men into this meat grinder and get chopped to bits and never think of changing their tactics whatsoever. Um, so we're going to talk about poison gas in a little bit. Here's a German Maxim machine gun and two German machine gunners using a gas mask. Problem with the mustard or chlorine gas, you better hope the wind is at your back. And so they had to get gas masks. You may have seen one upstairs. The model for the World War I gas mask was modeled after the old plague doctor's um, mask, getting back to the Italian Renaissance and the Black Plague. It didn't really work well back then, and it didn't really work very well in um, World War I. So here are some of the fortified uh, French towns, what we now know as the Maginot Line, 
and the beautiful city of Leuven that was just destroyed. It's rebuilt, but you can clearly tell that it looks much newer than um, the old stuff. The other problem that's going to um, face the French and the British as they enter the war is the amount of displaced persons. The Belgians and the French fleeing clogged um, the roads, and so the armies couldn't get to the Germans to slow them down because the roads were clogged with, uh, clogged with refugees fleeing. Um, King Albert of Belgium had his steam engines um, run into each other to collide, to slow down the German onslaught, because they couldn't hold them back. Um, the saying in Paris was, all of France um, should pray, because this is not going well. That's in the Western Front. Over in the Eastern Front, very quickly, a group of Germans were fleeing westward, just like the Belgians and the French were, because the Russian army had gotten its act together much faster than anybody else thought they would. And so all of a sudden, the Russians are steamrolling into um, um, Germany. And a uh, controversial poster was used called the Russian Rapist. It showed these you know, big you know, gorilla-like Russian soldiers you know, grabbing women like, like King Kong to get men to sign up to go into um, the war. So the Germans on the Eastern Front are led by the old tag team of Paul von Hindenburg and Erich von Ludendorff, two, two generals who will be heroes of, of World War I. And they see the Russian armies are split. And in a brilliant Brit of um, generalship, they destroy one <coughs> army, they lure another one into a boxed canyon, and within a matter of weeks, they have inflicted two million that's two million casualties, wounded, dead, and missing on the Russian army. The Russians came out of the great strong, gate strong, and now they're in a lot of trouble. There is a great photograph of the Tsar going out to take charge. The general in charge said, what am I going to tell the Tsar? So he shoots himself. And Tsar Nicholas was a pretty tall guy, and he meets with his uncle, the, the Grand Duke, who's like 6'10" you got to think these are Peter the Great Romanovs. And he's staring up at him, and his uncle says, oh, don't worry about it. It's only two million. We got, we got, we got plenty more. It's not a big deal. But we're going to fight Austria instead of Germany. Those Germans are real tough. So this allows um, Germany to focus on the Western Front. 470-mile-long um, battlefield running from Switzerland eventually up to the North Sea. There's seven armies, two million men, fighting in and around central France. And German General Alexander von Kluck, I so love his name, um, is close to the Somme River. It is the last natural barrier to hook down into um, France. And the Germans are talking about marching through Paris and drinking wine and getting women and you know marching down the Champs Elysees. This thing is going to be awesome. The men have marched a long way. They can smell victory, and all of a sudden they're forced to stop. The French, as the Germans were coming down, the French were attacking with a plan they called Attack Plan 17. They wanted to get Alsace and Lorraine back. So the two armies were literally passing parallel. Germany stops going to Paris, turns to intercept them. And this will lead to the brutal stalemate that will lead to the over-the-top traditional all quiet on the Western Front World War I that we think of. Um, French men were actually in Paris sharpening old medieval broadswords to go out and defend Paris. And as a legend, it was kind of a propaganda thing, but it was actually partially true, 600 taxi cabs of, of Paris loaded up soldiers and drove them out to the Marne River to protect um, Paris. And so when that happens, and Algerian and Moroccan French troops come in, um, each army tries to leapfrog each other going north, trying to outflank and get it around or behind each other. And this takes them up into um, France and Belgium, places like Artois, the famous, you know, um, Stella Artois, um, the beer, Vimy Ridge, and the tiny, beautiful city of Yves that will be destroyed. I got a picture of it right over here. Within a couple um, uh, years, it is unrecognizable, and it 
Around Yeep, there was a shot fired virtually every single day of the war for four years, and 33% of the guys that were killed in this area died of drowning, you'll see here shortly, where the ground was so wet and muddy from the low countries and the rain and the explosions, they climb out of their trench and their kit, they'd start running and sink into um, the mud. There was no way to stop and, and get them out because you would be shot in what we know as no man's land. So, I was telling some of you earlier, in some areas um, of uh, this part of France, it looks like you could scrape some of the, the moss away and break the leaves out, and the soldiers could come back and start fighting them all over again. This is a place where we were. Uh, let me scrape off this moss. This is a German field trench, and the Germans um, built uh, an, an iron foundry and a concrete works, and they had iron and rebar and concrete building their trenches. Then they began to tunnel down. These gentlemen standing right here, um, they would be standing right about here back in 1914. This is the exact same trench system. They had communication lines. They had electrical lines. Um, the fronts were fiercely guarded with jagged punji sticks and um, barbed wire. If you come up here in the touch tank and look at the German barbed wire, it's really wicked and jagged, and the French stuff kind of looks like like blackberry bushes. It's not really intimidating or scary at all. And down here, they had a kitchen. They even had their own brewery. So while it isn't great living, you had a little sense of sa safety, and concrete and rebar is a lot better than what the French trenches um, will be. Here's a couple guys finding some old 100 year old um, German beer. It tasted um, really good. <laughs> uh, um, everywhere um, you went, you know, the Germans really spent time fortifying their position. It's almost as if they said, okay, we've at least made it this far. If you want us to leave, you're going to have to you're going to have to make us go. We're work right here, 30 miles from Paris. And down south, where the Americans are going to fight at a place called the Croix Hill, the Germans and the French will actually tunnel. They will dig miles and miles of tunnels trying to get at each other um, to fight over this one big hill in the middle of um, a flat, wide open field. So if you are French, and I really hate to do this to, to the French, this is what you would be in. It was an earthen ditch um, dug with a little trenching tool like the one right here. And yeah, it's, it's kind of deep, um, and it gives you some safety, but it's not concrete and rebar. You don't have hot and cold running water, and you're not making your own beer, and if it rains, it really, it really sucks. Um, uh, one of the things I did on, on my birthday, um, you, know, you know, growing up, in rural Ohio, you know, being afraid of the dark is, is not an option. And I slept out here for the better part of one night. And I'm like not too far from a cemetery over a, a little town. And man, it was actually, I knew there was no ghost out there. I knew there was nobody trying to kill me. And man, it was really uncomfortable and kind of um, spooky. So um, anyway, here is the uh, um, battlefield. We'll tell that story later. This is poor Yeet after a couple months of the battle, just absolutely destroyed. And you hear the low countries. Well, this part is literally below sea level. And so you look at these guys trying to carry a wounded soldier out. This guy is up to his knees. These guys are up to their hips, literally slogging through a sea of mud trying to get a wounded comrade out. This horse is in a nice dry area trying to bring a water barrel to, to the soldiers. This one's up to its stomach, all right? And this is one of my favorite photographs. It, we don't know if he's allied or German. It's a soldier out in the middle of, it looks like he's in Tartarus somewhere. Like there's no recognizable landmark. You have no idea um, where he is. This is the battlefield. This is what guys spent their time fighting in. And here is an intrepid American trying to help me, trying to help me French out. Like, look, guys, I'm going to show you how to, how to do this. And the uh, point is, this right here is a uh, German um, artillery um, spotter's box. It's where a command center 
where they actually went underneath the um, ground and they called in artillery strikes. It's 60, maybe 80 yards away. That's how close some of these front lines were. One guy behind concrete, this guy sitting in an earthen ditch. And that's how things are going to go for the next several years. So we begin to fortify these things with barbed wire. What's the life expectancy of my man um, right here? Right? <laughs> Not real good. Right? So we can't get at each other, so artillery is going to be um, brought in. And artillery is just nasty. So we're going to have three types. One type is your basic Napoleonic cannon, a gun that will shoot, kind of has a little art to it, but it's more about range. But it can't get to guys in trenches or foxholes. Then we have big howitzers that will fire about 27 to 30 miles. So from about here, we're landing things on the runway at um, RDU. Not when the colonel's flying, though. All right, very welcome. All right. And so that means to get at each other from these close distances, we need artillery. And especially in France, they had a bunch of musket balls left over from Napoleon about this big, kind of like a smoothbore musket ball that they put in artillery shells that would explode in the air. An old British general named Shrapnel came up with, up with this idea, and they begin to cause just absolutely hellish wounds, wounds that doctors didn't know how um, to fix. We've got uh, Dr. Samuelson here from the, from the dental school. Um, not making fun of this guy, but he needs, he needs a lot of work. And what's sad is, this guy actually survives, but he has to live with a wooden kind of jaw and nose prosthetic for the rest of his life. They were called skull splitters because they would punch through the air. The helmets were made out of tin. It didn't stop anything. And so people will devise different ways to get at each other. Here's an old mortar, and here's one of the shells that would um, go in it. You have 150 of these half-inch you know, lead or steel balls. It's like a giant shotgun being fired right down um, on top of you. Then the German, the famous potato masher hand grenade, was made with that wooden handle so you could throw it on an arc and get it into an uh, uh, opposing trench. So while we're stuck in this static warfare, we're going to think of different ways to kill each other. Which brings us back to um, the poison gas. Chlorine and mustard gas would burn your skin, make it swell up, and eventually destroy, cause you know, blindness and destroy your lungs. You would pretty much you know, cough up phlegm and blood until you die. Very painful, very nasty. There's a famous picture of Canadian Van Du soldiers being led away from the front, holding each other's hands like they're small children because they're blind. They are blinded from a mustard gas. Mustard comes on later and it's got that name. They put a little tint into it so people could actually um, see it. My grandfather was mustard gas um, uh, in the uh, Meuse Argonne. But here is a gas mask. German version activated charcoal with these giant big bug eyes. And I was telling some people upstairs, when you see Star Wars, the guys who fly with um, Darth Vader have those masks on. Well, they get it from back here. The German one worked okay, but this leather was hot. It was hard to breathe. The glass would fog up. You couldn't see, so guys would usually just, oh, the heck with this, and throw it down. Our poor French friends. God, I hate to do this. <laughs> they said, yeah, that fancy thing, heck with that. All you need is a big, thick compress of cotton and urinate on it. The urine will filter out the poison, tie that around your mouth, so in time of gas, pee really Oh, okay, you got to pee, and that did not work at all. Um, the Germans actually devised some for the donkeys and, and, and mules, but they didn't worry about blinding the um, poor animals. Um, trench life, um, along with the uh, peeing on the old cotton swab, trench life is absolutely um, miserable. Um, guys call it um, misery, despair, and stupidity. The life was just nasty. The front line was used for fighting. Um, the second trench was used for like backup reserves and where you would triage the, the wounded. And the third group um, was where you would sit 
and uh, have your, um, you, when you fought for a week on the line, you got a couple days in, in, in the rear. Uh, we were talking about PTSD and the modern warfare, how we're still dealing with it in, in today. Well, part of the invalids that Napoleon had built for his wounded soldiers became a hospital to try and diagnose how to deal with what at the time called shell shock. Well, the British especially would just bring a guy back to this third line and let him sit for a couple days, and then they'd send him right back um, in. So, um, uh, this is what I call the German um, full moon. Um, if you were uh, extremely lucky, um, you would arrange a ceasefire in the morning so everybody could go to the um, bathroom. Hey, Hans, yeah, Franz, pass me the um, sports page. And you hope somebody didn't um, shoot at you. Um, but this is how most guys live. You're knee to ankle deep in water, you've got trench foot, um, you know, your skin is rotting off your feet. You have your two type of shelter. You can go with this horizontal one where you couldn't stretch out, but it provided you a little bit of safety and comfort. Or the vertical trench where you dug deep in, where you would like lay down for quiet and try and get some sleep. But if this one caved in, your buddies probably wouldn't be able to um, dig you out. Um, so most guys went with this um, version. And here it comes, we're almost to the American part, the great battle of Verdun. And Verdun is a battle fought for 300 days. It'll claim the lives of millions of people. And it's, um, the guy who thought it up was actually the crown prince of, of Germany. He wanted to get into the war, but his dad wouldn't let him. So his buddy, Eric von Falkenhayn, does have a pretty cool name, says, everybody's fighting up north, let's go and hit them down south through the fabled city of um, Verdun. And they attack in February of 1916. At this point, <coughs> halfway through the war, and there has been five million deaths. Not casualties, but deaths. All right? And the French, the, the British, and even the Germans are beginning to scrape the bottom of the barrel of manpower. This thing was supposed to last six, eight months, and now we're on year two and a half, and we're still going strong. Nobody wants um, to quit. One million shells were fired on um, Verdun, pretty much destroying the entire city. There's the beautiful city um, of Verdun before the battle, and here, is, here it is about um, midway through. And the French are going to fight fanatically. Um, attacking Verdun, the only thing it did was raise the French hatred towards Germany to a fevered pitch. And so we have these guys, if you can tell, they're living in this trench. Here are dead and wounded men laying outside. Gas in the flamethrower was used here. Here is a French soldier in a foxhole with these burnt out skulls. This battle went on every day for 300 days, <coughs> consuming lives on either side. French Nobel Prize winning um, poet Jean Junot said, we were nine men to a foxhole, we, um, we ate, we had to go to the bathroom, we couldn't go out of the hole or we'd be killed, so we did it in our hands, we did it in our helmets, and we threw it out. This is just absolutely miserable. And the French high command would rotate every French unit up to Verdun to take their, their turn. When it's done, 20 million artillery shells will be blasted in and around Verdun. A lot of them are still there. You'll see some pictures shortly where due to the soft earth, the shells sunk and didn't explode. And due to the freeze and thaw, they slowly work their way up. So French and Belgian farmers to this day are being wounded or killed by unexploded World 